This is KTN Friday Briefing with Betty Chialo. The issue of uh, uh, various communication centers does not arise. The intelligence fallout, just who knew what before Westgate attack. How safe are we? Security lacks in major establishments. Judiciary Star Wars, why Shalei wants Mutunga's team investigated. Makaburi is alive and well. Tension, then relief in Mombasa. Welcome to Katie and Friday Briefing tonight. We continue to mourn with the families that lost their loved ones during the Westgate Mall attack. But we also celebrate the lives of those who lived to tell the story. This evening we have the latest on the happenings around the world. And later on in place of our guest anchor segment, we will have a special tribute to the people who lost their lives during the Westgate Mall attack. First, let's take a look at our top stories tonight. Now, KTN can authoritatively report that various key security agencies were warned not once, but twice about an imminent terror attack on the Kenyan soil. KTN has obtained a detailed confidential brief to the various government ministries, among them the National Police Service, warning of a terror attack on the 13th and 20th of September this month. The briefs were made to, among others, the Inspector General of Police, David Kimayo, Interior Cabinet Secretary Joe Joseph Olelenku and the Secretary to the Cabinet, Francis Kimemia, informing them of increasing threats of terrorism and plans to launch simultaneous attacks in Nairobi and Mombasa. Dennis Onsarigo begins our Friday briefing coverage with, with exactly who knew what before Saturday's attack. As the dust settles at the Westgate shopping mall, the efficiency or lack of it of key security agencies have come under sharp focus lately. In what appears as a terror warning that has taken over one year to materialize, the settling of dust appears to have just but begun. The biggest question within security circles is how men and women, approximately 10 or 15, could gain access to an ultra-modern mall and for a straight four days, test the firepower of the government. It is now imagined that maybe key security agencies might have been tipped about a possible terror attack. In a confidential brief sent to key security ministries, and which contains briefs dating back to two years, key security agencies and government departments were told about an imminent attack in Nairobi and Mombasa areas. The briefs detail the arrival of several Al-Shabaab terror agents in the country as early as September last year to names of those suspected to have taken part in the mall attack. The reports normally dubbed situational security intelligence briefs talks of three men suspected to be foreigners who had arrived in the country and teamed up with two other men from a slum neighborhood in the city. The reports appear to confirm a story KTN aired this week, where a security officer told us among those who took part in the attack were two young Kenyans from a slum along Juja Road. Normal intelligence reports are generated by the spy agency, National Intelligence Service. In a situational report for September this year, the National Intelligence Service had warned of an impending attack in Nairobi and Mombasa on the second and third week of this month, but the actual attack took place on the 21st. We are aware of the many figures being churned out and various uh, allegations of being quoting somebody here and there. But the categorical and official government communication is only from this team. National Security Intelligence Service claimed the intelligence reports were handed over to these men, handles ministries, key security agencies fall.
The four-star general Julius Karangi, whose forces battled the aftermath of the terror plot that became a reality. The inspector general of police David Kimayo and the interior cabinet secretary Joseph Olelenku. The report in particular says a detailed intelligence report was handed over to the Interior Cabinet Secretary, Joseph Olelenku, three months to the Saturday attack at the shopping mall. The Interior Ministry has since downplayed the possibility that maybe there were intelligence reports that it overlooked. We have also read uh, with concern uh, the issue of various information emerging from other points. We want to urge Kenyans that the positions we give here is a collective team decision arising from the work we are doing at the West Gate. Insiders have told KTN the national intelligence reports are always vague and at times cover a wide area of concern, making it impossible for a stretched police force to implement them. Ladies and gentlemen, and good afternoon. For now, what should have been done appears to have been done bringing to an end four days of a standoff. Dennis Onsarigo, KTN Prime. Now at Westgate, mystery continued over the bodies that were said to be buried under the rubble. Interior Cabinet Secretary Joseph Olelenku now says no more bodies have been recovered so far and no one has been reported missing since the operation ended. KTN's Wilkie Senyabwa has our update from Westgate. Westgate Shopping Mall on Friday, a normalcy begins to return to the area. Access roads leading to the mall are open to the public. Shops that have been closed since the attack reopen, and members of St. John's Ambulance, who have been serving here since Saturday, quietly shut down their operations. They say their work here is done. Basic casualties have been evacuated. Now, whatever is going on is people who are either dead or buried under the rubble or whatever. Now, we will not be able to help them to serve any purpose. But clues about the horrific events of Saturday still linger here, evident in the heavy security at the entrance of the shopping mall, officers barring the public from accessing it. And while security forces are easily visible, information is scanty. The government would address the matter from a different venue. The Interior and Defence Cabinet Secretaries banding together with national heads of security. On Wednesday, the government announced the beginning of forensic investigations into the Westgate attack. Forensic investigations into the Westgate mall terror attack that took place on 21st September 2013 are ongoing. It will be prejudicial at this time to reveal any further details. It is important to note that this is a very delicate and complex operation that requires time. The team would further assert that police are holding eight suspects after three others were interrogated and released. The death toll still remains at 67, despite reports that there may still be bodies left in the building. At some point, a few of our people were allowed to get in, and when they came back, what they told us is that the scene inside there is horrible. There's water inside, there's blood, there are bodies inside there and it was just not good for, for the eye. And with a shroud of mystery now surrounding the investigations at the Westgate Mall, the country now settles in to wait for any further news. Wilkie Sanyabo, KTN. Now, as the country recovers from the Westgate terror attack, new questions are emerging over the country's preparedness to prevent future attacks. A spot check by KTN suggests major security lapses at various establishments. Najma Ismail takes a closer look. Most security guards across the country seem to have a routine of how they check Wananchi or potential customers, moving the metal detector up and down and sideways. But is this the correct mode of doing it? <laughs> At the Taski supermarket in Kisi, the security guards conducted their routine check amidst chit-chat. Most of these guards are just armed with their metal detectors and nothing more. They say they fear for their lives every day since they do not have the proper apparatus to deal with any eventualities. We are very much vulnerable because 
We don't have any reinforcement should anything happen unexpectedly. Yep. We, are, we are not safe because anything can happen and then away. We. The Nakumat supermarket in Kisi, however, did not seem to have put any security measures in place as the front gate remained wide open for motorists to drive in and out. In Nakuru at the Nakumat Westside Mall, security guards confessed that the searching mirror they use does not reveal anything unusual. <laughs> Here in Nairobi at the Sarit Center, which is next to the Westgate Mall, security check was no different with the occasional frisking of metal detectors. However, the mall which was hosting an annual book fair recorded a low turnout unlike previous years. I think we can attribute it to the Westgate event. Uh, parents perhaps are scared, they do not want to release their, their children for this event. Questions that many will be asking after the Westgate incident is whether our security measures are up to standard to prevent or predict future attacks. Najma Ismail, KTN Friday Briefing. President Uhuru Kenyatta today joined family members and friends at the mass and burial of his nephew Mbogwa Mwangi and Mbogwa's fiance Rosemary Wahito who perished in the Westgate Mall terror attack. Friends and family met at the Nairobi Chapel before proceeding for the burial ceremony in Gatundu in Kiambu County. Mbogwa Mwangi is a son to Catherine Mwangi, a sister to nominated Senator Beth Mugo and former politician Gegi Mwigai who are first cousins to the president. Other relatives of the president, among them his sister Christina Pratt, escaped unharmed on Saturday as gunmen attacked the mall, beginning what would be a four-day siege that resulted in massive deaths and destruction. <laughs> May their souls rest in peace. To the Judiciary Wars now, and Chief Registrar of the Judiciary Gladys Bostrele has now written to the Chief Justice William Utunga of an alleged plot to kick her out of the Judiciary. Shuley wants a public inquiry into what she calls a war strategy allegedly drawn by the CJ and five of his confidants. She says she no longer has confidence in the Judiciary Service uh, Commission and wants the probe against her to be conducted by bodies such as the Auditor General, Ethics and Anti-Corruption Authority and the Independent Police Oversight Authority. Yesterday, KTN obtained leaked emails suggesting an intricate plot involving top officials of the judiciary to kick her out of office. The emails between top officers and the Chief Justice point to a five-man strategy team around the Chief Justice that accuses Cholet of usurping the Chief Justice's power. But as Samogina reports, the CJ is now warning that those who leaked the emails could be prosecuted. A day after leaked emails pointed to a vicious war in the judiciary revolving around the CJ on one hand and the chief registrar on the other, Dr. Mutunga's office fired back. In a statement sent to newsrooms, a communication consultant in the CJ's office, Komuchesi Makoha, accuses unnamed persons of hacking the email account of the chief justice. The statement reads in part, quote, the judiciary leadership is determined to eliminate this surveillance culture by closing in on the small, cowardly and criminal enterprise that believes that it can violate official and private communication at will, end of quote. And he wants those behind the email leaks of possible prosecution. And I quote, anyone who can hack an email is essentially a criminal who deserves to be dealt with in accordance with the law, end of quote. But a string of fresh emails suggests that there may be no end in sight for the Star Wars in the judiciary. In what appears to corroborate the so-called 30-point plan against Gladys Cholet, the Chief Justice has now called a meeting of all judges tomorrow, as indicated in one of the leaked emails, to address their concerns over salaries. And a memo to that effect has already been circulated to the judges. In an email seen by KTN, Dr. Mutunga's Chief of Staff Duncan Okello writes to Justice Isaac Lenaola, who is out of the country, to avail certain documents for what is described as an urgent meeting. Okello writes on the 25th of September, quote, 
The CJ has convened an urgent meeting of all judges this Saturday. One of the issues to be discussed is the salaries issue. Will you be back or who can you delegate to? A day later, a seemingly exasperated Justice Lenaola fires back, quote, I return on Sunday so I'm unable to attend. What is the emergency and why such a short notice? And if I'm needed, why did no one give me notice to change tickets? Who arranged for this meeting and what is the agenda? End of quote. I would like to just make a brief a clarification. The chief registrar had in her testimony before a parliamentary committee accused the section of the Judicial Service Commission of a witch hunt after the committee voted to send her on compulsory leave. But the leaked emails have put the spotlight on the chief justice's office. In one of the emails, the CJ words in writing to the four men he calls his general stating, quote, As your commander-in-chief, I say, my generals, let us start the initial battles in this war. Let us get into the mud. The war has been accepted by the general. End of quote. The mail dates 20th September 2013, 9.02 p.m. With the CJ undertaking to pay the bills of all dinners used for crafting the assault on the judiciary's chief registrar. The correspondence alludes to what is called the judicial transformation bloodbath in the first week of October. The chief registrar was suspended by the Judicial Service Commission over allegations of fraud but returned to work following an out-of-court settlement. The JSC has given her a list of questions to answer over the allegations of impropriety. But with the latest turn of events, there is no telling how the Star Wars in Kenya's third arm of the government will continue. Samugina, Ketian, Nairobi. And Samogina's story leads us to a big question tonight in which we ask, are you confident that judicial reforms are on the right track? Are you confident that the judicial reforms are on the right track? Do text us a yes or no comment with a brief comment to the number uh, 22155, 22155. You can also tweet us at Kate in Kenya or at Betty Kialo and we'll sample your views during this newscast. To Mombasa now where police had a hard time calming down a section of residents following reports that a close associate of controversial cleric the late Sheikh Abu Rogo had been killed. Several businesses closed down and some people stayed away from the town as the rumors about the killing of Abu Bakar Sharif Makaburi and a son of the late cleric spread. But as KTN's Ferdinand Omondi reports, both the police and Makaburi had to come out to allay the fears. A usually calm city of Mombasa was shaking from within as rumors spread fast that Abu Bakar Sharif, also known as Makaburi, had been killed. Several youth had even reportedly planned a huge protest immediately after the Friday prayers. And the man in question, visibly alarmed and very much alive, called a swift conference to defuse the tension. Mimi na wambia vijana niko hai, hakuna haja ya kufanya fujo lolote, watu wakae kwa salama. The rumors and tension caught the attention of Mombasa security organ. Mombasa County Commissioner Nelson Marwa was furious. These individuals are hell-bent and they have ill motives to cause despondency to ensure that Kenyans in this county start fighting. Makaburi had close relations with the late Sheikh Abu Drogo, who was killed in a hail of bullets last year by unknown persons. His death elicited violent protests in Mombasa that lasted one week. Now, Makaburi is reading a conspiracy theory. I think uh, they are afraid of uh, the public's reaction if they kill me because of what happened due, uh, after Abu Drogo's death. So they wanted to see how will the public in Mombasa react. So they started rumors before doing whatever they want to do. However, security chiefs insist this was a plan of mischievous people. <laughs> We are aware of that and we are not going to sleep. Police are calling on the public to be extremely vigilant and to report any suspicious activity for immediate action. But they are also cautioning against spreading unfounded rumors warning that this might lead to arrest and prosecution. Ferdinand Mundi, KTN, Mombasa.
All right, we're just about to take a short commercial break, but before then, let's uh, remind you of our big kit tonight. And we are asking, are you confident that the judicial reforms are on track? Are you confident that judicial reforms are on the right track? Do text us a yes or no response with a brief comment to the number 22155. That's 22155. And I will sample your views during this newscast. Katie and Friday briefing will be back in a short while. Stay tuned. Just ahead, facing the knife under the cover of darkness. Tweet of the day in association with Imperial Bank Arsenal debit card. Back to Katie and Friday briefing. Now, as the deadline for determining election petitions draws closer, several petitions have been concluded. Winnie Kamau has the details of election petitions that were determined today. It was a sad day for former Nairobi Mayor George Lado when the High Court upheld the election of incumbent Makadara MP Benson Mutura. Alado was also ordered to pay the cost of the lawsuit amounting to 2.7 million shillings. The High Court has revoked the nominations of Senator Harun Kipchumba and Let Kemunto, who were nominated to represent persons with disability in the Senate. The court also ordered IABC to pay the cost of the suit. Senator Naisula Lesuda's nominations was upheld by the court after dismissing a petition challenging her nomination in the Senate. As IBC maintained, it was ensuring ethnical and regional balance. Petition engulfed Mombasa Court as Justice Frederick Cheng upheld Joho's election as a violently elected governor. Mombasa High Court dismissed the petition lodged by Suleiman Shabahal, who was also slapped with the cost of 3 million shillings. Winikamau KTN. Here now is a look at other stories making headlines tonight. Ian Fuller has these details. Judges at the International Criminal Court have granted Deputy President two more days of adjournment to attend to national issues. The Deputy President William Ruto, through his lawyer Karim Khan, had requested the judges to give him additional time to allow Ruto assist efforts during the Westgate siege. When Jen Majani hit headlines after nurses were caught on camera mistreating her as she delivered her baby on the hospital's floor, she did not know that it was a blessing in disguise. This morning, together with her husband, they received visitors from Ace Africa, an NGO that deals with the welfare of women and children. The NGO offered Jen a job as a trainer since she had earlier studied education but failed to get employment. Elsewhere, Nyakach Member of Parliament, Aduma Awor, who had early last week been charged with tampering a dead body after dumping an 80-year-old man with two arrows sticking through his chest at the doorstep of the Nyanza Regional Commissioner's Office, was arraigned in court today for a different charge. The MP was accused of attempting to stop a police officer from arresting a suspect. He denied the charge before the Chief Magistrate, Mrs. Lucy Gitari, who granted him a personal bond of 100,000 shillings. The case will be heard on 2nd October. Finally, the Kenya Red Cross has vowed to use all the money and items it received as donation from well wishes to assist during the waste kit operations transparently and accountably. So the figure we are talking about here is 102,331,349 Kenya shillings. This is a huge amount of money that has been raised in a span of less than six days by ordinary Kenyans. People giving their contributions as part of their solidarity, patriotism, to help their brothers and be their brothers and sisters keepers for that matter. Ian Ofula, KTN. Now to a story of darkness, the knife, and an old practice. We are talking about male circumcision, and in one corner of Kenya, it is being practiced under the cover of darkness. Katie's Ferdumulo traveled to Tesseland, where tight work schedules and culture are giving a whole new meaning to the knife. Tea that bestrides Busia in Kenya and eastern Uganda, circumcision does not feature during initiation. As a result, anti-HIV activists have been trying to promote the process among sexually active males here with hopes of cutting down infection rates. But one of the obstacles they have to face is the social price that those who undergo the medical procedure have to pay. We realize that uh, <clears throat> most men above 25 years old are not coming in for circumcision. Most of the clans we're seeing are between 
uh, 15 and 24 around there but uh, these people are above 25 year olds so very few of them about 20 percent many uncircumcised Teso men find the task of facing the knife during the day onerous and prefer to do it at night some have very busy schedules while others would simply lose their standing in society <laughs> The procedure that lasts less than an hour and takes about one month to heal from has come under fire after a Kenya AIDS indicator survey showed that it does not reduce HIV infection rates. So we are looking at strategies that can make most of this older population come in for circumcision and uh, moonlight is one of the strategies that we've implemented so in teso north and teso south today uh, we are carrying out this program for now ngos continue to push their campaigns forward with hopes that cultural strictures on this side of the country will not neutralize their work for katie and i am fredo mulo now, like I mentioned earlier on, tonight we will not be having our guest anchor segment. Instead, we are paying tribute to the many people who lost their lives during the Westgate terror attack. May their souls rest in peace. Those were some of the people who lost their lives during the Westgate terror attack. Well, let me now sample just a number of some uh, tweets which are coming in in regards to our big question tonight in which we had asked, do you think the judicial reforms process is in, in, the, is in the right track? And um, Mike Tambo says, the whole judiciary now needs an overhaul. It is hard to trust anyone there with the unfolding events. That is Mike Tambo from on Twitter. Uh, someone else says, of course not. With all this broad light battle, the reforms are far from the right track. Who is fooling he who here? That is Timothy Olechisni. Um, uh, Ch Sir Charles Kenya says, no, the judicial reforms is still born. Thank you very much for your comments. Please continue sending them. We will sample them as we proceed on with our bulletin. We take a short commercial break, but Joy Doreen Vera is up next with the day's business. Stay tuned. Insurance companies unlikely to compensate car owners. KTN Business tells you why. You are watching KTN Friday Briefing. Good evening and thank you all for staying with KTN. My name is Joy Doreen Bira. A look at business. The National Treasury has said last weekend's terrorist attack at the Wastegate shopping mall will have insignificant impact on Kenya's economy. In a statement to Newsroom's National Treasury Cabinet Secretary Henry Rotich, however, acknowledged that there would be direct and indirect costs of the siege like destruction of property, business disruption and redundancies occasioned by the siege. These costs, Rotich 
Each father added may be felt in the various subsectors, among them the wholesale and retail trade and services, hotel and tourism, but the net impact to the economy would be minimal. The assurance from the National Treasury comes at a time when Australia and the United Kingdom have issued travel advisories to Kenya over the incident. Additionally, Moody's credit uh, ratings have also warned that the attack may have a negative rating impact on Kenya's economy in the short term. During the week, key economic pointers like the stock exchange and currency markets have exhibited resilience to the attack. Car owners during the Wastegate shopping mall terror attack are like unlikely to be compensated by insurance companies. This is due to the fact that most insurance firms in the country do not have cover for such incidents. Adelaide Chagole with the details. The terror attack at the popular Westgate shopping mall left in its wake several vehicles damaged at the parking lot. Those on the rooftop parking of the beleaguered mall were either burnt to a crisp or sunk with the building while those on the ground parking were sprayed with bullets. And now nearly a week after the siege and losses being counted, the fate of the cars, many not insured against acts of terrorism, is now sinking in. If you had insurance cover that protects you against acts of terror, then you recover outrightly. If you didn't, you may need to talk to your insurance company to agree on how you move forward in respect to your claim. However, not all is lost since the Association of Kenya Insurers says some of its members may compensate car owners on compassionate grounds like it happened following the August 1998 bomb blast. It will depend on one, whether you had the cover, two, the relationship that you have with your insurer, three, how the insurer would want to look at the whole this whole, uh, whole. In the meantime, the body is urging the state to find a way to minimize the impact since the attack was on the government of Kenya and not on the affected people and businesses who are just collateral damage. It would be important for the government of Kenya to look for ways and means of how, to a certain extent, maybe not wholly, to a certain extent, that they will be able to compensate uh, some of the, the people who, lose, uh, who lost their lives, um, others uh, lost their properties, um, as a way of showing some goodwill. The body is also proposing the establishment of a political and terrorism market pool where all insurers providing cover against terrorism will be able to pool their risks, something that will reduce the high premiums currently available for these covers and also increase the number of players willing to insure against such risks. When we put all these risks together and we form one pool, then Purchasing reinsurance cover is going to be reasonably cheap. And when the reinsurance is cheaper, the primary insurance cover is also going to be cheaper to the, to the consuming public. Adelaide Chungole, KTN Business Today. Thanks, Adelaide. For that report, the government has once again called for expression of interest in setting up a fertilizer factory in Kenya. The international tender published in local dailies seeks for an investor with proven track record in production of fertilizer. Michael Karanja has the details. Kenya's agricultural sector has in the last 50 years been affected by the high cost of inputs, among them fertilizer. This has seen the sector's contribution to the overall economic well-being of the country fall every year. The fertilizer demand in Kenya is estimated at 500,000 metric tons annually. To meet farmers' expectations, President Kenyatta's recent visit to China and Russia is said to have focused on the growing need to put up a fertilizer plant in Kenya. In the release expression of interest by the Ministry of Agriculture, the government is keen to engage with a strategic investor or a reputable fertilizer manufacturing firm with extensive experience in manufacturing DAP, CAN, and a range of NPK fertilizer. Through this, the government plans to bring down the cost to the farmer and exploit the potential market that exists in the region. Those interested will have to highlight the structure of ownership of the project, a proposed implementation plan, and an approach of transfer technology. Already a private company, MEA, says it is considering putting up a fertilizer plant in the country in partnership with a group of Chinese investors in Nakuru. Early in the year, the same ministry had indicated narrowing down to four international investors that it said would be crucial in setting up the plant. If successful, this could be the third attempt by the government of Kenya to establish a fertilizer producing company. The most controversial attempt was a 1975 initiative in which the government partnered with Enren, an American firm, to establish Kenren Chemicals and Fertilizer Limited. Michael Karanja, KTN Business Today. 
and milk processors have joined hands to publish their recommended retail prices three days after the government issued a value-added tax exemption. This, they hope, will help cushion consumers from unscrupulous traders. Philip Kitani reports. The price of milk in a number of retail outlets, especially those within the estates in Nairobi, continue to be above the recommended costs. These are seen consumers feel the pinch even after the government, through the Kenya Revenue Authority, clarified that milk was exempted from the VAT law. The price was have even seen the milk processors publish public notice informing consumers of the recommended retail prices of the various milk brands. The notice just like that of the taxman was clear on what type of milk VAT exempt and which one is not. <laughs> I have to reduce the price so that every person, whatever to a chini, whatever a Well aware of the discrepancy in pricing charge at retail outlets, the Revenue Authority has been conducting sting operations to rein in on errant traders. Philip Keitan, Keitan Business Today. Now, throughout the week, the Kenya shilling has maintained resilience against other currencies. Let's take a look at how the Kenya shilling fared today and also the listed companies. And that's it from the business desk for today. Being a Friday, well, it also marks the third day of national mourning uh, in the country. And well, we hope that those bereaved can be comforted. My name is Joy Doreen Bira. I hand you back to Betty Kello with more news. Thank you very much, Joy, for that. Let's now have our top story recap. And tonight, KTN can authoritatively report that various key security agencies were warned not once but twice about an imminent terror attack on the Kenyan soil. KTN has obtained a detailed confidential brief to various government ministries, among them the National Police Service, warning of a possible terror attack on the 13th and 20th of September this month. The increased threats followed a warning from the Israel government of plans by terrorists to launch attacks on its citizens and um, installations between uh, the 2nd of September and uh, 28th of September this month. It is understood that top security chiefs were informed well in advance of a pending attack. a segment that's a favorite to many myself included where we learn the correct pronunciation of certain words joining me from Kisumu County is Willis the word master Willis good evening great to see you tonight great to see you too Betty how is Nairobi we are doing well let's get straight to it now for example someone says uh, Willis I'm so excited I've just received an award or an award 
we say an award award we have a and a combining to form the long vowel sound mm -hmm. o award reward we also talk about a prison warder warder not warder mm -hmm. a game warden or warden not warden so we say award award all right so after you received the award there's something people usually say do you say thank you or thank you oh betty we say thank thank oh, not okay. thank you see when we talk about received pronunciation we say thank you not thank you just mm -hmm. like bank rank tank not tank bank mm -hmm. rank no so thank you someone when someone would argue that bank sounds <laughs> much better than bank <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but uh, basically it's an American way of saying it. So when you talk about bag, somebody from America may say bag. Okay. Man, man. So we have such kind of aspects. But when we talk about the English English pronunciation, Betty, we say thank. All thank right. you. Uh -huh. So let's talk about my career, what I do. Uh, am I a journalist or am I a journalist? You are a journalist. Ja, journalist. journalist. Mm -hmm. We talk about journalist, not journalist. The mm -hmm. way sometimes we mistake the pronunciation of that word. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's, let's go to a, 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 an interesting one here that is used so many times. Do you say um, Edith Kimani gets uh, flowers often or often? We have two acceptable pronunciations for that word, Betty. You can say often and you can also say often that is when you now opt to pronounce that word the phonetic way following the phonetic spelling often or often two alternatives allowed mm -hmm. do you have journalists who say parliament today was very interesting or is it parliament today was very interesting betty letter i in that word is silent so we don't say lia we say la so we say parliament mm -hmm. parliament mm -hmm. not parliament all right let's come to an agreement or agreement that stress comes after a so you say agreement mm -hmm. agreement mm -hmm. agree agreeable agreeably Ag agreement no agreement agreement or, all right. What, what about management? Is it management or management or manage? With this one, Betty, the stress comes right at the onset of that word. So mm -hmm. you say manage, manager, management, not management, the mm -hmm. way sometimes some of us mistake that <laughs> word to be. Not <laughs> management. It oh. is management, management. All right, so Willis, we have another word that is usually used by sports anchors and sports reporters and fans. <laughs> Let's say football fans, you know, rugby fans. Is it uh, the stadium was jam-packed or is it the stadium was packed to capacity? <laughs> Betty, it's great of you to bring this word, a very tricky one always. We say stadium, stadium or stadium. But we don't say stadium, stadium, <laughs> no, stadium. Just like we say radium, we also say medium, medium, radium, medium, stadium, stadium. Well, thank you very much, Willis, the word master. Always a pleasure. See you again next Friday. See you again, Betty, and have a nice weekend. All right. Well, that has been Willis, the word master, coming to us live from Kisumu County, helping us to pronounce those troublesome words correctly. You can also tweet me. You can tweet me at Betty Kialo, at Kate in Kenya, those words that you have trouble pronouncing, and he's going to be of assistance. That is Willis, the word master. Let me now bring in uh, Nicholas Mudimba, 
who has always had problems pronouncing the word stadium. Nick, I know you usually say stadium. <laughs> Today now you now you know. Good if is one of the uh, actually culprits today. The flower issue, but thank you today at least you didn't mention my name. But today, Betty, let's go straight into sports. We have more on the rugby sevens team, and of course, big upsets as far as the Kenya Premier League is concerned. We'll give you all that after a short break, but also coming up in sports. And also coming up in sports, Daniel Sekuta to debut for Kenya in the IRB season opener, Down Under. Time now for Kate in sports. I'm um, Nicholas Mudimba. Billy Odiambo and Dan Sekuta will make the international debut in the IRB 7's first leg in Australia after being named in coach Felix Ocheng's 12 man score. The technical team has gone for experience, knowing in the back of their minds the type of pool they are in. Oris Utin is the notable absentee and is out of the first round nursing a thigh injury. Dan Sikuta, Mamba player and a former footballer, was in former coach Mike Friday's training squad but has never been promoted to feature in international matches. But Felix Uching and his technical bench members have been watching him closely and they were convinced the former Kitale Boys alumni is ripe to be thrust into the international arena. His star shone brighter during the Safaricom 7's circuit and represented Shuja during the Safari 7's last weekend. He was instrumental in Shuja's win against Australia Renegades in the final match. Billy Odiambo has been the pillar for Strathmore in the circuit and also showed his prowess with Shuja in the 7's extravaganza. The fact that uh, Sikuta is unknown is an advantage to the team. Someone like Skuta coming in, he's not there by default. Skuta makes the team through hard work. The team will be accompanied by two conditioning coaches, Michael Owino and Geoffrey Kimani, led by Felix Ocheng, who will be occupying the hot seat for the first time in the Arab series and he'll be out to prove he's up to the task. Experience will play a huge role for the Kenya Sevens rugby team in the coming first leg of the IRB series to go down from 12th to 13th of October. Go. Coach Felix Ocheng has gone for full strength 12 months squad. Notable absentees only Horace Otieno who is out injured. Colin Sinjera is fit and is back with the team while Andrew Amondo will remain the team's captain. Defending Premier League champion Stars KFC suffered a painful 3-2 defeat to Energy's Nairobi City Stars at the Kasarani Stadium this afternoon. The win, the first Premier League tie for new coach Jan Koops, lifted the Kangaroo SI to position 10 in the league standings with 30 points. In another encounter, Sofa Parker was held to a barren draw by visiting Sony Sugar. Both teams failed to capitalize on several scoring chances in a match that may had predicted in favor of Sofa Parker, Sony Sugar climbed one position up to 26 points. Some team beside who will face Karaturi Sports in the next match remain on the second position of the table with 39 points and still optimistic of having a chance to clinch the title this year. Leaders Gurmahia welcomes Sony Sh Sugar Mill and Siamil Alinyao Stadium in one of the four fixtures lined up. Gudensha Makoha and Brenda Kaimomos will return to the Mexican cities of Tiguan and Mexicali five years after representing Kenya in the World Junior Championships in 2009. The duo now international under-23 team headlined Kenya's team in the inaugural competition that has attracted 12 teams. Kenya being the only African representative after Algeria pulled out. The Kenyan team has been spassing up at the Casarani Gymnasium. Kenya is in pool A with the U.S., Turkey, Brazil, China and Cuba. According to the team's assistant coach, Halima Bakari, the tournament will help expose most of the players who are soon graduating to the national team, the Kenya feature queens led the country on October the 2nd. And of course, stay tuned to K10 Sports Final tomorrow from 2 p.m. We'll focus more on the junior queens. Now, moving on, Football Kenya Federation is racing against time to have the Moise Stadium Kisumu ready for the Sakafa Senior Challenge Cup in December. The rehabilitation work, which is behind schedule, is currently ongoing, albeit painstakingly slow owing to the use of manual labor. According to the contractor appointed by FIFA of the Greenfield Sport Turf System, laying of the artificial turf is expected to, com to be completed at the end of November. 
Women, men and young boys and girls carry stones as others arrange them on a soon will be a soccer pitch. The Moy Stadium in Kisumu. This is the painstaking process the contractor has employed. But even though the process is slow, the contractor of Focles says laying the turf will be completed in good time for Kenya to host some of the Sekafa Senior Challenge Cup matches in December. Ever since the problems with the materials were resolved, the progress of work has been satisfactory and we have now thrashed out uh, a revised program according to which uh, we have um, a target date of completion of end of November. The process of laying the artificial turf is taking longer than normal. To achieve the standards required, artificial turfs require proper drainage for it to last longer. One factor which is, uh, we cannot control, of course, is the weather. And if uh, we have uh, rainy weather, that would definitely uh, hinder the progress of work, both with regards to the civil works, but also the installation of the artificial grass. The government's role in the rehabilitation work was to put up a perimeter wall, pavilion, and erect the floodlights. See, in the other march. And that's all for Katie Sports today. I'm Nicholas Mudim. Have yourself a blessed night. KTN Sports, in association with Guinness. He believes a man's name finds its meaning not in what he says, but in what he does. A name that is made of more. KTN Weather, brought to you by Morton Doom Power Guard. Thank you very much, uh, Nick Mudimba, for the spots. Let's now have a review of our big hit tonight. And uh, we had asked you, are you confident that the judicial reforms are on the right track? Are you confident that the judicial reforms are on the right track? That was our big hit tonight. And 90% uh, say no, they're not on track. And 10% say yes. Uh, let me sample one or two. Uh, someone here says no. What we are witnessing has nothing to do with reforms. A cartel has ganged up to silence and finish one of their own for not playing ball. Shame on Mutunga and company. That is Thomas uh, from Kakamega. Someone here also says Kenyan judiciary system lost its shape a long time ago, so I have no confidence in it because in spite of all these reforms, there's still no integrity. Another person says yes, they are now reforming themselves. They have not left uh, their names. Uh, um, Another one here, maybe a last one. Yes, the judiciary is doing the best. Why is Sholei worried if she is not guilty? Thank you very much for all your responses. And indeed for watching KTN Friday Briefing. My name is Betty Kalo. Resume next week with all our segments. Stay tuned to KTN.